Okay. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Being Present with Leonard. I hope you're finding these teachings helpful and uh, very supportive on your journey of awakening. And hopefully uh, you've all watched previous episodes, so um, you have a pretty good sense of what this is all about. Okay, so today's um, topic is going to be conscious communication. And I consider developing your communication skills as fundamentally important in the context of living on planet Earth, whether you're awake or whether you're not awake. It is really, really helpful to improve your communication skills. So let's talk about what do I mean or what makes up conscious communication or what contributes to um, a lack of conscious communication, in other words, unconscious communication. And we all, we all know um, how difficult that can be sometimes and how easily uh, unconscious communication can lead to all sorts of conflicts, arguments, disagreements, marriages can break up, all sorts of things go on. You lose your job because you don't know how to communicate in a way that um, is conscious and appropriate for someone who's on the path of awakening. So <clears throat> I'm just going to randomly speak about some of the elements that would constitute conscious communication, conscious and clear communication. I think the first one, and this is probably the most important one, is learning how to listen. Most of us don't have a clue how to listen. If you're speaking, the person you're speaking to should put themselves on hold, just like you put a telephone on hold. Drop your perceptions, drop your opinions, drop your viewpoint, drop, your, your, drop everything, drop your perspective so that you can hear clearly what the other person is saying. And then... When it's your turn to speak, then the other person, me in this situation, will just be present with you and listen carefully to you. And I might even um, indulge in some active listening. Now, what is active listening? I need to know if we're communicating together, we're out having coffee or whatever it is, I need to know when I speak that you really understand what I'm saying so I could invite you to reflect back to me what I said. It's such a simple, simple technique, but um, it, it lets me know as the one speaking that you actually have heard and understood me or what I'm trying to say. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to agree with me, but you do have to hear what I'm saying before you agree or disagree or even before you respond. Learn to put yourself on hold. In other words, drop your position, drop your attitude, drop your preconceptions, drop your judgments, drop your opinions, at least while you're, you're, uh, the other person is speaking to you. And just be really, really present. Hear what they're saying. Then you can respond authentically and the other person will hear um, what's being said. Uh, it's very important. You have to learn how to put yourself on hold. And that can be very difficult because we're not used to it. We're used to just believing in whatever we have to say and pushing forward with it and not necessarily hearing what someone else has to say. So when you're having a conversation, an argument, anything, it doesn't matter what it is, any kind of communication, you have to understand that just because you perceive things in a certain way, it doesn't mean that the person you're communicating with perceives things in the same way. So it's only by listening, really listening, being present and listening, that you're not getting confused um, by your self-righteousness. The truth is everyone's going to have a different perspective. And, and it's important to hear what the other person's perspective is. Uh, it's often said, put yourself in the shoes of the person you're talking to or communicating with. Put yourself in their shoes. Where are they coming from? What's happening with those people? Can you understand where they're coming from, which will help you to communicate more clearly and more effectively if you put yourself aside and recognise who they are and, and where they're coming from, what is their perception 
are they misunderstanding what you said? You have to inquire and check. Uh, so you can't be assured that your perspective is correct. In fact, the truth is your perspective and their perspective, meaning the one you're communicating with, and neither of your perspectives are true. They're just perspectives. They're just how you see things in the moment or the situation that you're talking about, communicating about. You might see it from different perspectives, but your perspective is no more accurate than the other person's. There's no truth in perspectives because your whole past comes in. Your whole uh, anxiety about the future comes in. Uh, your relationship with your mother and father come in, all your school days come in, everything comes in to inform and affect your how you perceive, or in other words, your perspective on the communication between you and whoever you're communicating with. So um, <clears throat> don't believe too much in your perspective. It's not true. Well, what's the truth? The truth is nothing's happening, not in this moment. So... Let's all relax into that simple truth. Now, <clears throat> it's a really good idea to learn how to pause. Take a breath, pause. Don't respond immediately. You could even say to the person you're communicating with, give me a moment. Let me take that in. Let me, let me feel that. Let me sense that. What are you saying? Let me take it in. Give me a moment before I respond or before I react. You see, a response is not anywhere as, as negative as a reaction because your reactions are always based in the past. So um, <clears throat> it's also very important as a part of conscious communication to not project onto the other person. Don't talk about the other person. Just share what's going on with you. What do you want? What do you need? What are you feeling? Don't start blaming the other person or putting it on the, per the other person. Um, and we all do that unconsciously, consciously. We, we don't want to have to take responsibility for what's coming up within us. So um, you know, it's very helpful if you can be um, clear in your communication and concise. The less you say, the more effective your communication. The more you listen, the more effective your communication. So uh, <clears throat> now the other thing is, if you're triggered in, in this context of communicating with another, if you're triggered, you need to recognise that you've been triggered and you need to go away for a moment or two or more and deal with what's being triggered within you. Our natural tendency is we want to blame the other person we're communicating with. You did it. You made me hurt. You hurt my feelings. You made me angry. No, nobody made you angry. That's your reaction based in your past and based on your limiting beliefs and repressed feelings. So if you are triggered, emotionally triggered, some strong feelings are coming up, don't, don't try and communicate. Or the most you should communicate is, wow, I think I've been triggered. There are some pretty strong feelings arising. Please give me a few moments to process this and then I'll come back and talk to you. But don't try and communicate when you're triggered. It's going to go all wrong. You're going to dump on each other. You're going to become defensive. If, if you're attacking someone or blaming someone, I can guarantee you they're going to become defensive. So <clears throat> just share your feelings in, a, in an authentic way and a responsible way. In other words, you can say to whoever you're communicating with, I feel angry, or I feel hurt, or I feel sad, or I feel needy, or I feel afraid. It doesn't matter what you feel, but by communicating your feelings, it's much, much more powerful and much more effective than communicating your thoughts about your feelings. If you say to somebody, I'm feeling hurt, that's going to disarm them instantly. They're not going to attack you. They're going to feel sorry. That nobody wants to hurt you. But we hurt each other constantly because of our unconsciousness. So learn to share your feelings authentically and responsibly as a part of conscious communication. But if you're really triggered and you can't do that, then excuse yourself until you can. So if you're angry at the person you're communicating with, 
Go to your room by yourself so that the person doesn't hear you. Kill them three times and then come back with a smile on your face because the anger in you is satisfied. Now you can come back to being calm and communicate clearly. Now, one of the most effective aspects of communication, and none of us are very good at it, is to very clearly and vulnerably communicate what we want in this moment or what we don't want. Say somebody's yelling at you or speaking too loudly or the music is too loud, whatever it is. You can speak lovingly and clearly and share what you don't want. Please turn the music down. It's too much. Uh, it's, it's upsetting me. Now, if they don't want to turn the music down, there's nothing you can do about that. It's time to leave and go for a walk until the music is softer. You can't impose your will or what you want on, on another. You can negotiate, you can compromise, but you can't impose what you want onto another. And the same is true for the other. They cannot impose on you what you don't want. So we, we must all come to that realisation and that kind of agreement um, between us. So, you know, if your emotions are triggered, take responsibility for that. Once your emotions are triggered, you're no longer in reality. You're in the dream and the dream goes all the way back to your childhood and the dream is loaded up with all your limiting beliefs, your repressed feelings, your judgments of yourself and others, the way the ego functions, and losing yourself in others. It's all there when you go back into the dream. So if you're triggered, excuse yourself and deal with it. And this teaching shows you how to deal with it. Okay, so um, there's only a couple of points left that I want to mention, which... Uh, uh, one of the things that I've noticed is most damaging, most destructive in communication, whether you're conscious and present or awake or not, whether you're lost in the dream, one of the most destructive patterns that we, we've all developed is the need to be right. We'll just keep arguing and arguing until somebody wins and I'm right and you're wrong. Well, you know, that's a form, I, I consider that that's almost vicious. <laughs> you can't do that to each other. Um, the need to be right, you're not right, you're never right, but the person you're communicating with is never right. The best that can happen is you have a deeper understanding of what they're saying and they have a deeper understanding of what you're saying. It's not about right or wrong, it's about do you get what I'm saying, do you understand it? And am I saying it in a way that's non-threatening? Even now, my manner of speaking is a bit too intense. That's just me, what can I do? But you have to soften your tone when you're communicating. Don't be too intense. It frightens people. And speak calmly and peacefully and kindly and lovingly. So um, don't be right. Be love. Don't be right. Be kind. Much more important to be kind and considerate and listen than to be right. Because if you think you're right, you're wrong. So let's all get over that. Now, of course, there is one element I haven't mentioned yet, uh, which is the most important element in all communication, is to master the art of being present. Because when you're present, it's so much easier to communicate in a conscious and effective and simple and clear way. You can say whatever you want, but say it in a loving, kind manner and don't be attached to the person knowing what you're speaking about. If they don't understand what you're saying, they need to ask you, uh, they need to say to you, I don't understand, could you explain it more, please? Because it's important in any kind of communication that we understand each other and that the communication is not being driven by the ego. Um, I mean, look what's happening in the world today. Nobody knows how to communi communicate effectively. They don't even know how to stop a war. Uh, they, and they don't know how to communicate in a way that would avoid a war. So we humans are in a sorry state as far as I'm concerned. We need to wake up. Okay, so I think that's enough on communication. Uh, I've got a few questions to answer, but I'm going to answer them fairly briefly. Um, <clears throat> this question is from Ashkan from United Kingdom. Dear Leonard, thank you for your teachings, which I have just discovered. In an interview, you mentioned that you were a copywriter when you went into the retreat and had your first awakening. Well, that's not exactly true. My question is, how did you make a living after that? 
The reason I ask is because one of the biggest challenges for me is the integration of consciousness in day-to-day work duties for making money, which is very much future and goal oriented but needs to be done to pay the bills. Many thanks, love and peace, Ashkan. Well, you know, that's a pretty important question, Ashkan, because we all do have to learn how to integrate awakened consciousness into our day-to-day life. It doesn't mean we go into the dream and get lost there. It doesn't mean we're always in the mind with those thoughts that never stop. It means that we're fundamentally present, but we can play in the world of time without getting lost there. We can engage with people. We can have friends. We can have relationships. We can go to work. All of that is more than possible. In fact, you know, I like to say to people, you better hurry up and get enlightened because that's the easy part. I'm going to say that again. You better hurry up and get enlightened because that's the easy part. Okay, then what's the hard part? Living in the world of time after awakening because you're living in a world completely populated by unconscious people who have very little interest in truth, presence, awakening, or even enlightenment. Um, Luckily, that's changing a lot in today's world, but it's still how it is. Uh, even as you become more and more present, even if you're fully awakened, you're living, going to be living in a world where no one is present. So um, <clears throat> it's it's very good that you're going through a process now of integration. I've had six of the most ridiculous, over-the-top, out-of-control, multidimensional awakenings over a period of 18 years. And I can tell you, and I didn't know this when it all started, But I can tell you very clearly that um, after my probably second, third awakening, I don't remember exactly, but I realized very clearly that after each awakening, there was a process of integration. What opened up within me until it's integrated is not really a part of me. It's It's a state of consciousness. It's a dimension that I can move to, I can awaken to, but I'm not really fundamentally grounded there um, <clears throat> until I am. So um, just have to look at that question again. Um, a couple of things about um, making money. You know, how do you integrate consciousness in day- day-to-day work duties for making money, which is very much future and goal oriented? Well, you know, it doesn't have to be. Do what you love. Do what, if you're becoming more and more present, then what you want and how you want to express yourself in the world is going to change. So go with that flow. You don't necessarily need to immediately go with that flow, but you do need money to sustain yourself. And it's also good to have a little bit of a nest egg just in case, although that's definitely fear-based and future-based. So maybe I'll withdraw that statement. Let's go with the words of Jesus instead. Let's go with the words from the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. That's He's giving us a clue. Don't go too far into the future. Don't worry about security. Just do you have enough for today? And if you do, great. Be grateful. Say thank you. And then tomorrow, ask yourself the same question. Do you have enough to sustain you tomorrow? Well, when you are, but now it'll be to today. Do you have enough? Now, there's nothing wrong with having a job and working, but make it work for you. It doesn't make any sense if you're going to spend six, seven, eight hours a day and you don't enjoy what you're doing. That's ridiculous. Find something that you enjoy. Now, one other side to that that I might mention, and I often say this in my retreats in answer to this kind of question. Hey, don't worry about what you do. Just get any job. You could be working in a supermarket, stacking cans. But let me tell you, if you're present, as you stack the cans, you will awaken very quickly. Awakening is far more important than making any money. Although we all have to make money. I have to make money. We all have to make money. But the focus of making money should be how do you love to express yourself? What do you enjoy? If you're not sure, then do the job that you don't enjoy until you but keep your eyes open for something else that is a beautiful expression of the opening and awakening you. 
Um, that's just how it is. Now, you ask me, uh, did I, I worked as a copywriter before I went into that first retreat and had my first awakening. That's not in, or entirely true. Let me tell you very briefly my work history. First of all, I studied and graduated in law at the University of Melbourne on March 2nd, 1970. On March 3rd, 1970, I was headed on the good ship Fair Star, headed for England for a three months vacation. And I came back five years later to Australia. So I just kept moving and responding to whatever was happening. Now, I must say that's before any awakenings. But um, so I wasn't, I was a, a barrister. I wasn't a, a copywriter. But then I realized being a barrister, which was a very high status, high level uh, occupation or profession, it's like a very high status. I realized it wasn't my true calling, but I didn't know what my true calling was. So uh, I literally just resigned overnight. Uh, people thought I was crazy. And then um, I didn't know what to do next. Now, listen carefully because I'm still answering your question by sharing my own story. I didn't know what to do. In fact, after I resigned from being a barrister with wig and gown, the whole thing, I didn't know what to do and I got quite uh, depressed about not knowing what to do. But two words I took with me uh, with my resignation, two words that were really important to me. And I, I knew that these two words would guide me where I needed to go. And those two words were creativity and communication. But I didn't know what that meant or where it would take me. So I, I thought about it and I meditated, I contemplated. What, what job could I do that, can that includes creativity and communication? The answer was get a job as a copywriter in an advertising agency creativity, communication. I did that for two years before I realised that definitely was not my true calling. And then, uh, then I had my awakening. But I had resigned at least six months prior to that, before my next awakening. The, one of the points I'm making to you is you don't know what comes next. How many of you in this video now have made plans only to recognise that those plans not only didn't work out the way you thought they would, but you went down a completely different path? And sometimes the most difficult times in our lives are the most productive. They set us off in the right direction if we're responsive. All right, so um, it is important to integrate <clears throat> awakened consciousness into day-to-day -day life, including work. <clears throat> so find your way. Don't make it a problem. Find your way. Be an explorer. Be in the flow but also at the same time, take responsibility for your life in the world of time. I often say to people, you're responsible for two things. You're responsible for your life in the world of time, no matter how awake you are. But the second thing, and really, is, which is the first thing, you're responsible for the degree of presence you're living with day to day. You're responsible for the degree of presence and the amount of awareness you bring to the dream in your, in your journey of liberation from the dream. So, um, okay, so this is from Robert from Billings, Montana. Hi, Leonard. Are you saying that when I feel emotional pain, that's coming from my story? You betcha. I am saying that. Um, sometimes I call it the world of the mind, just so people don't get confused. The world of the mind, the past and future world of the mind, a world of memory and imagining together with all our concepts, ideas, opinions and beliefs. That's what I call the dream. Now, a lot of the time when you're in the dream, it's very benign and it's not a problem. But there's always elements of the dream filtering through into your life and making your life much more difficult than it needs to be. Without the past, your life would be really rosy pink and rosy and joyful, without the past filtering through the limiting beliefs, the repressed feelings, losing yourself in others, the judgments. Without all of that, who would you be and how would your life be different? So um, <clears throat> that's the story. So uh, Robert from Billings, Montana, um, where are the feelings stored when you repress feelings? And we've all been repressing feelings 
from a very, very early age, from very early childhood, because they were too much for us to deal with. Children don't know how to deal with anger. Children don't know how to deal with shame or rejection or judgment. So they repress those feelings so they don't have to feel them, and the ego is very actively involved in helping you to repress the feelings. So what happens is we repress all these emotions from the past, then somebody in our life today triggers the repressed emotions and um, a feeling comes up, a strong feeling, maybe anger, maybe sadness, maybe hurt, maybe emotional pain, maybe unfulfilled need, a, a kind of needy feeling. Uh, those feelings might come up. Now, here's what's really important. The feeling is coming up in the present moment. And you know that one of the keys to being present is to be present with whatever is showing up in the moment, which would include the feeling itself. So in this moment, you might be present with the feeling of anger. You might be feeling it. You might be experiencing it. But then if you follow this teaching, you allow the teaching to exp the anger to express in a, a very responsible way, meaning you don't dump it on anyone, you don't hurt anyone with it, nobody else is involved. It's just you expressing your feeling to allow it, allow it um, liberation, allow it to re release from you if you do it in the right way. So um, here's the catch, and this is most important. Every time a feeling arises like anger or hurt or sadness, it's going to have a story woven into it. Somebody did something to you that hurt your feelings or made you angry. Someone's to blame. Somebody's not fair, whatever it is. Um, but the truth is, all that happened was somebody triggered the feelings that are already there. So you have to, so in other words, the story woven into the feeling has nothing to do with the present moment. It's from the past or from the future. It's, it's memory or imagining, most likely memory way, way old memory. It can even go back into previous lifetimes. So um, uh, you have to master the art of allowing the feeling to surface, feel it, experience it, don't disconnect from it, don't disassociate from it. But at the same time, you can't get involved in the story woven into the feeling. The fact that the feeling is arising is of the present moment, so you have to be present with it. But what the feeling is about, the story woven into the feeling has nothing to do with the present moment, so don't get involved. Be neutral. Be a little bit surprised by the story the feeling is revealing to you. And then you'll see it in, the con in a much wider context of how you got caught and what is required to liberate yourself. So um, I think that's enough, uh, Robert, for, for that question. Um, don't be afraid of emotional pain. It cannot hurt you. Anger can't hurt you. And if you don't dump it on anyone else, it can't hurt anyone else. And God wants you to allow the anger to express because otherwise it stays repressed within you. And you cannot awaken fundamentally with all these repressed feelings because they'll constantly be triggered. So... Learn how to liberate this, liberate the anger in a responsible, conscious way. It doesn't harm anyone. But also there's hurt, sadness, pain. What do you do with that? You cry. Simple. Okay. Andrew from Bucharest, Romania writes, Dear Leonard, I feel like letting everything go and become a monk at a monastery. Is it something related to the dark night of the soul? Okay, Andrew from Bucharest. I must tell you, I've been having a little bit of a fantasy about that myself recently. I can't deal with all these daily issues. I don't want to. Well, daily issues of managing your life and managing a house or managing where you live or whatever. Um, it gets a bit much. So I did have the thought occasionally that, geez, maybe I should just go and live on a monastery. And the truth is, this teaching, it, it can be a real burden. I've always have to be available to everybody. Um, who wants me to be available. So, you know, you just do your best. So, uh, but let me tell you a funny story, uh, Andrew. Many, many, many years ago, I was, this is before any awakenings, but um, <clears throat> I was traveling around Scotland as a, as a tourist and I went to visit this rather grand old monastery in Scotland. And it was... Um, 
an active uh, monastery. There were lots of pre. It was a Catholic monastery. There were a lot of priests there, a lot of nuns, a lot of this and that. So, um, you know, and we were kept separate from the uh, monks and the nuns, and uh, but we were allowed to go into the dining hall and eat at the same time. So we we visitors, tourists, would go in and sit at the table, and then after about ten minutes, the monks, and there must have been about fifty of them came filing in to the uh, dining hall and slowly sat down. Now, this is what I witnessed, and I'm not joking. The, at the beginning of the, uh, the procession of, of monks were the younger monks. They looked pretty alive and pretty with it and pretty clear. But as the procession progressed and the people in the procession got older and older and older, I could see they were, they were less and less and less present, awake, or even knowing what's going on. So joining a monastery doesn't mean anything. Um, I mean, it might be appropriate for a while. Um, in China, when I go to China, because Buddhism is quite large in China, I have a lot of Buddhist monks and nuns coming to see me, and, and uh, most of them are lost. They're lost in the rituals. They're lost in the concepts. They're lost in the beliefs. So just becoming a monk in a monastery is absolutely no guarantee of awakening. Now, if you're already awake, it might be very appropriate to go and spend some time on your own or in the monastery or maybe go into the desert or the forest. Sometimes you have to be alone just with yourself. And you can accomplish that in, in a monastery because, you know, you don't talk much. So you're mostly with yourself. Okay, so... Um, that's the end of the questions, and it's going to be the end of our web, of our episode today. Let's all pause for a moment. And I want you all to recognize how easy it is to be present. It's instant. You can't practice your way to presence. You can't meditate your way to presence. Why do I say that? Because the present moment and everything in it that is of the present moment, is already here. Why would we seek something that's already here? Why would we practice and practice and practice trying to find something that's already here? You just have to open your eyes, slow down, and bring yourself present with what you see, moment to moment, what you hear, moment to moment, what you feel, touch, taste, smell. Just come back to your senses, slow down and bring yourself present with what is here in the moment with you. Then I can ask you, who is present in this moment? And if you're really present, you would answer, I am. That's the awakened you, the I am that you are, the I am presence. the one who is here now. I am here. You are here. We are sharing this moment of now. I am love. You are love. We're sharing this moment of now. I could go on and on. I am peace. I am silence. I exist in the realization of oneness, and so do you. You know, the hardest, one of the hardest things to, to get, and I don't like the word get, but to realize, that sounds much better. One of the hardest things to realize is that you are already a fully awakened being. Just like Buddha, just like Jesus, just like Ramana, or anyone else you'd like to name, you're already a fully awakened being, an enlightened being in samadhi. And you always have been, you always will be, and you are in this moment. That is the truth. But something happened to us. We went too far into the dream, into the world of the mind, thinking too much, becoming addicted to thinking, becoming habituated to living in the world of the mind. And in so doing, we disconnected from the truth that is ever-present within you. 
So this is more about relaxation and fine-tuning, at least for step one, becoming present. Relaxing and fine-tuning. You notice your thinking, now you're present. You notice your thinking, now you're present. It's always instant. It's in the moment of remembering that you're present. You notice your thinking, now you're present. And it becomes almost second nature. I mean, and there comes a point where you don't even have to, to say now I'm present because you're always present, at least to a reasonable degree. And then there are times when you drop into that infinite, eternal, immortal dimension where you open into oneness, God and heaven on earth. But you can't look for that. You can't seek that. Just seek presence and have the intention well, you can't have an intention. Just be present and notice whether you're um, full of gratitude, generosity and love. Generosity and gratitude for what is actually here. When you can recognize the abundance that is here in this moment, your life will begin to flow in a very abundant way without you doing a thing. You don't need positive thinking. You don't need affirmations. You just need presence and the deep recognition of the abundance of this moment. Okay, folks, so that's going to be it, it for now. Uh, let me quickly look at the comments. Okay, it looks like my sound was good. My appearance was acceptable. And not a lot of people watching, so uh, we'll see how many watch, watch the replay. Um, okay, folks. Don't forget to hit the like button. If you're enjoying these, uh, these episodes, by hitting the like button and by sharing and by commenting, you're actually, re the teaching, what I'm sharing with you, will reach more people. And isn't that what we want? So be generous in, in making comments. Be generous. I mean, if you have a negative comment, that's okay. But um, just be generous. Uh, the other thing is, you know, if you go to my website, you'll see a whole bunch of books that you can order through Amazon. And it's one thing to be present with me in these episodes. It's another thing to read the books. And it's yet another thing to attend a live event. So the whole purpose of this is, is for you to awaken and to uh, enjoy the whole journey of awakening. Okay, folks, so that's it. Thank you for your uh, presence. Thank you for being here, and we shall meet again. Don't forget to subscribe.